Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the number one show that provides you with the news and views of all things medical. Doctor in the House is back on the air and the theme as usual is healthy lifestyles. Thank you to our cherished and much loved viewers for all your calls and best wishes. Sit back and relax. Prepare yourself to be challenged, excited and inspired during this evening's program. We have a fantastic one in store for you. And as usual, we're live on Monday nights, but you can tell friends and relatives that there is a rerun on Saturday at 1 p.m., that's Saturday afternoon at 1 p.m. You don't need a cable to look at Doctor in the House because we are also streaming live on the IBN website and on YouTube as well. So on YouTube, when you're searching the IBN master, you will be able to download and view Doctor in a House, your number one show. And as usual, let's start with some news of medical interest. Shub Dipawali to the national community as we join Hindus worldwide in the celebration of light over darkness, good over evil, and knowledge um, over the ignorance in the society. And... Uh, its celebration includes millions of lights worldwide, and Trinidad is no exception. And I know that we have so many Hindus who are firm fans of Doctor in the House, and we, we wish them God's blessings during this holy time of the year for them. There are also some holidays in the United States. Columbus Day, which remembers and marks a remarkable feat that helped launch the age of exploration and discovery. That will tend to also be remembered locally by the first time a first people's one-off public holiday will be celebrated here. And that's being held on Friday the 13th of October in recognition of the legacy and contribution of the Amerindian culture to the Caribbean. Some unfortunate news, though, in terms of the budget blues. Everyone seems to be singing the budget blues after last week's contribution for 2018. And it was marked by a gas hike and a plethora of taxes met with protests and anger. So I saw in parts of southeast Trinidad, um, in Rio Claro and Mayaro, that some of the residents were blocking the road, they were burning debris in protests about some of the, some of the proposed taxes and belt tightening measures in the budget. Casinos may well be closing and price hikes for many consumers are expected. The health sector I was seeing of relevance to Dr. the House, the health sector will have um, a slice of the pie worth $6 billion and there will be increased license fees to private hospitals, which are expected to garner more than half a million dollars. The Children's Hospital, I await to see in the new year what will be the contribution to that, to the healthcare sector in the country. So that should be rather interesting as well, the rule of the Children's Hospital. Maybe it's time as well, to, if there's one of the taxes that I'd like to bring into the forefront, it's time to tax sugar-sweetened beverages. Barbados has already done it with very positive effects, Mexico and other parts of the world in combating childhood obesity. It's time to tax sugar-sweetened beverages. The scourge of crime and the carnage on the roads continued, unfortunately, and I've mentioned it ad nauseum on this show, and 
Unfortunately, over the weekend, it was highlighted by three youths being killed in a smash-up in central Trinidad. During the budget, um, we were reminded as well, too, that there, there has been a, a, a steep increase in unbecoming behavior amongst parliamentarians. Um, of course, we know the parliament is often referred to as the highest court in the land, and it's little surprise to see that viral videos were being released on social media over the weekend of bullying in the nation's schools. And it was great to see the Minister of Education taking a firm stance and involving the, the law in trying to deal with the perpetrators of bullying in the nation's schools. And hopefully, too, the trauma that would be inflicted upon a victim would be dealt with, too, by the Ministry and not just the Minister of Education, but the Minister of Health and national security. Some sad news, and we send our blessings and best wishes to the family of Clive Panton, uh, certainly one of the foremost educators, ministers, senators, humanitarians, and statesmen of this country. My family's interactions, so we had some personal interactions with Clive Panton, and my family's interactions with him were always memorable. And he was indeed a true leader, patriot, national hero, man of the people, gentleman and scholar. Rest in peace, Mr. Clive Panton. And certainly indeed to our thoughts and prayers with the family to a former Chief Justice, Keswick, who died last week. He was laid to rest as well. There was a great initiative by North Central Regional Health Authority so in an attempt to promote behavior change in children at Mount Hope. So we've been speaking about this whole scourge of childhood obesity. We know that the risk for type 2 diabetes is quadrupled in children who find that they're struggling with their weight. If they're obese, um, their chance of becoming a type 2 diabetic may be as high as four times that of a normal weight child. And of course, all the complications of obesity may be increased. And some of the children at that Mount Hope secondary school had to be rushed to the hospital at Mount Hope because of high blood pressure. So I don't think that they were admitted, but it's something to actually bear in mind. Not just the chance for diabetes, but high blood pressure, cholesterol issues, fatty livers, polycystic ovaries. So a lot of young women and girls find that they're having problems with their periods, that they're overweight hairier than usual, they have acne, and that creates a milieu of resistance to insulin. So, but, so the body starts to produce more, more of the insulin as a result in order to compensate, and then eventually the blood sugar rises, and there is an increased chance for type 2 diabetes. We're seeing more and more, and there, there has been um, some great research locally, looking especially at the darkening, the, thick, the thickening and darkening of the skin in the necks, maybe at the knuckles of our nation's children. And that may be a skin sign, a skin marker, that the child is at an increased risk for diabetes. So with this launch of healthy living for children, for school children, and that's the target from the Ministry of Health, Trinidad and Tobago's first Olympic gold medalist, Hazley Crawford, who himself suffers from high blood pressure and diabetes. He walked with two bags, one with a blood pressure gauge and one with a sugar machine, a gauge for diabetes. And he has become one of the spokespersons as well to for healthy living and saying that, you know, about the value for fruits, vegetables, snacking on nuts and cucumbers and all in moderation. He is a self-confessed former junk food connoisseur, which led to his becoming a diabetic. So it's great that um, former Olympian Hazley Crawford has lent his voice to healthy lifestyles in Trinidad and Tobago. Staying with health problems, especially in the nation's schools, there seems to be a surge in the incidence of pink eye or red eye, which is also known as conjunctivitis. So it's an inflammation of the thin, clear lining of the white of the eye and the inside of the eyelids, known as the conjunctiva. It's highly contagious with many causes, viruses, bacteria, fungal, it may be allergic. And you may have seen, actually, some of the videos on social media about one of the 
herbalists are advocating the use of insecticide spray, and please, we know that's total madness, that you don't want to be using that because, well, apart from the fact of irritation and perhaps sight-threatening or potentially life-threatening complications, that's not going to work. Don't sleep or swim in your contact lenses if you use that. Many of the contact lens wearers may find that they're an increased risk for infections of the eye or conjunctiva, or, or the, the lining of the eye or the conjunctiva becomes inflamed. Never share personal items such as washcloths or your towels or tissues. Cover your mouth when sneezing or you're coughing and avoid rubbing or trying to touch your eyes. Persons apart from the redness and watery eyes may find that it feels like a bit of grit is stuck in the eyes. Make sure that you wash your hands frequently. Use hand sanitizer to cut the transmission of conjunctivitis, pink eye or red eye. Perhaps as a reminder as well too that the flu season is starting. It tends to be marked by the start of winter in North America and Europe and get your flu shots is going to cut the incidence of the influenza virus perhaps by about as high as 70 percent so flu shots especially for persons with weaker immunities persons at extremes of age the very young or very old persons with medical illnesses such as diabetes heart problems strokes cancer kidney patients pregnant persons so if you have weaker immunities or vulnerable populations flu shots are available and usually they are free of charge at some of the health centers nationwide or you may want to seek um, private medical advice the month of october is usually marked as pinktober by all these pink ribbons to enhance awareness about breast cancer so it's also known as breast cancer awareness month and we know that it's an annual international health campaign organized by major breast cancer charities every October to increase awareness of this medical problem and raise funds for research into the cause, the prevention, the treatment and cure for breast cancer. So it's a brilliant one and the campaign also helps to enhance information and support to all those affected by breast, by breast cancer, inclusive of family members. And it was nice to see that uh, another one of the public health campaigns was launched in schools in the fight against cancer. And it's been themed appropriately, I care because cancer doesn't. So that's a school initiative to coincide with healthy living. Kudos to all those involved. Some tragic news over the last week, as Las Vegas was the scene of the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. It took the lives of 58 people and injured more than 500 others during a music festival outside of the famous Mandalay Bay Hotel. The gunman was a 64-year-old Caucasian, and he had stockpiled 42 weapons. Trauma surgeons had to perform more than 27 emergency surgeries on that very night of that tragedy, that massacre. And more than 70 surgeries were done in the first 24 hours. I was reading about some of the fascinating insights from healthcare workers into that horrific massacre. We look at it often in isolation, but thinking about the response, and I want to salute all the first responders I want to salute the excellent health care which was given to victims, to their family members following that Las Vegas shooting. I mean, local restaurants, um, apparently they brought in pizza, water and other food to the hospital to sustain families and staff. And grief counselors were also present there in Las Vegas. Some of the less critical patients were moved out and personnel were called in very quickly and some from home. So I think it's an example for the healthcare in this country, whether we will be able to in this country to deal with a tragedy or to deal with an emergency of that magnitude is yet to be seen. So Americans um, have learned a lot from the military, especially from wars that have been fought there, like, like in, um, in Afghanistan and how to deal with mass casualties. So, they, so in terms of management of pain, stopping bleeding, resuscitating patients with blood products, and there are some new tools on the field that can be used to stop bleeding. 
And many of the trauma surgeons, so many of the specialty surgeons, have been actually focusing on very quick operations or surgery to fix minimal things, like you want to stop internal bleeding and minimizing the toll and the stress on the body from major surgeries. So that's some of the advances that had actually um, originated from the battlefield. And some of these advances have found their way into trauma and the management of trauma, not just in the United States, but have been implemented locally by the excellent trauma and orthopedic and emergency surgeons locally. And one expects that somebody who has been involved in a massacre like that, a victim and a survivor, is going to have a complicated recovery that will last for many years. It has been estimated that um, in terms of um, injuries from guns and weapons in the United States, 46 billion US per year, 46 billion US would be lost from sick days or medical care. Maybe it's time there for them to start to tighten up gun control. They always speak about it after there's a massacre. You might remember when there was um, a shooting um, outside an Orlando nightclub last year. And it has been said, though, that in the United States, for all of those viewers who like to think that, you know, America is the place to be and they want to malign their homeland, rem remember that it's probably easier to buy a gun there than a pack of Sudafed in the United States. And that is an oft quote. Um, that, that is one of the quotes that's often bandied about following gun-related trauma and injury in the United States. So a packet of Sudafed for colds and sinus issues, it's probably easier to get a gun than Sudafed, which may require a prescription. When we're speaking about trauma and, you know, the gunman, so apparently he was prescribed medications for anxiety and sleep, like diazepam, which is known by its trade name Valium. And it's thought that one in five persons, especially as they're growing older, may have suicidal thoughts and loneliness. So the gunman was a 64-year-old man. Loneliness is a risk factor for depression. Just a reminder that screen family members, it's a reminder for all healthcare workers viewing the show to screen our patients for depression. Some of the symptoms may be subtle, a lack of sleep, a reduced appetite or perhaps an increased appetite, problems with memory, concentration, self-esteem, a loss of interest, a loss of zeal in things that used to give pleasure, even suicidal thoughts, feelings of helplessness, hopelessness and worthlessness may all form a part of the spectrum of this black dog called depression. A small study in Japan over the last week showed that maybe increased fish consumption may be useful in grappling with this hidden creeping epidemic of depression. Some of the popular shows too in the United States like Sesame Street, that children's program is launching a new um, so a, a new stream of programs to help children deal with traumatic experiences ranging from um, shooting incidents like these or your disasters to divorce. Rock, rock icon Tom Petty um, died as well too in the last week at the age of 66. He had a cardiac arrest and we remember some of his songs. Such a classic rock star from the 1980s. And staying in the United States and staying within the theme of infectious illnesses, so this week um, there is a big thrust towards dealing with infections in one of the cities in California in the United States. They're working to curb the spread of a hepatitis A, a surge in the incidence of hepatitis A um, epidemic. It's transmitted through contact with stools, with feces from an infected person and can spread rapidly, especially in close and sanitary conditions. So in that city, and you know, when we look at some of these areas in the first world, we can learn from it. We can learn from these thoughts and ideas and initiatives on how to stem or curb the spread of infections. And new hand washing stations and porta potties are dotting the city of San Diego in California, while nurses are walking around vaccinating. 
Uh, that includes um, even the homeless who might be particularly at risk for the spread and transmission of hepatitis A. We know that that's one of the viruses which can infect the liver, and it can be marked by so reduced appetite, yelling of the eyes, yellowing of the eyes, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And health workers in Puerto Rico are still scrambling to get medical care to some of the individuals impacted by Hurricane Maria. Puerto Rico has one of the highest prevalences of type 2 diabetes in the United States at 17%. And many of the patients there are, are using insulin. So imagine a diabetic who is on insulin and with a vial and a syringe, the vials need to be kept refrigerated. Think about, so after the hurricanes, and I want to compliment the entire IBN crew, and indeed, I'm all of the relief workers who have been sending aid to the islands affected after Hurricane Maria and Irma. 100% of the island, Puerto Rico, was without power following Hurricane Maria. And only 35% of the people had cell phone use, with less than half of the island having running water. So most of the patients who had insulin in refrigerators, that insulin was spoiled. So the medical relief workers and centers set up six zones to actually administer insulin or give fresh batches and bottles of insulin. Some of the doctors drove to more remote areas as part of the humanitarian effort bringing insulin and glucose meters. We often think about things like food and water, sanitary napkins, and those bare, bare um, those essentials which are required after um, a storm or a disaster of that nature. But when we think about the diabetics who require insulin, what about kidney patients who are normally on dialysis and they require that as a life-saving form of treatment? Many of them found that they were struggling, not just in Puerto Rico, but in the rest of the countries affected by the hurricanes. Hurricane Nate as well to threaten some of the southern parts of the United States, and there was some of the destruction there in places such as Louisiana. And a reminder as well to as we're still in the rainy season and following some of the stormy weather that we have been experiencing over the last week, just a reminder to be wary about mosquitoes and of course infections associated with them like Zika, chikungunya, dengue, and even the West Nile virus spread by the Aedes aegypti, that female restless mosquito with striped legs that is ubiquitous in this country. So be vigilant and be watchful about some of the signs and symptoms associated with the mosquito-borne infections, which might include fever, chills, trembling, pain around the eyeballs, headaches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, a skin rash, and of course, bleeding complications with severe forms. And following the Rio Summer Olympic Games in Brazil, many of the US athletes who returned were actually found to be infected with West Nile, and some actually had Zika and chikungunya on their return to the United States. So that information was released this week. The World Health Organization, staying on the theme to it, infections, the World Health Organization last week said that one of their targets, one of its targets, is going to try to slash deaths due to cholera by 90% by the year 2030. So that's one of the missions and aims of the WHO, to slash deaths due to cholera by 90% and hopefully consign this historical illness really to the history books. We know that it continues to affect more than 40 countries across the globe. Yemen is one of the recent places that had an outbreak of cholera, and we know that our neighbors, Haiti, suffered after the earthquake in 2010. And it has been estimated that more than 2.9 million cases with over 95,000 deaths per year are recorded due to cholera. It's spread by when you consume food and water infected by this particular bacterium. And some of the signs and symptoms include a pain in the abdomen and a profuse watery diarrhea with vomiting that can lead to extreme dehydration and death 
within a matter of hours. So it's good that they're initiating that fight towards healthy food and water, safe food and water, improved sanitation and vaccination in a public health initiative to battle cholera. 160 million school days are lost every year in the United States due to infections. And really and truly, kids do the darndest things. Some second graders in Virginia in the United States found that there were reduced levels of germs and fewer sick days. So they had to stay home sick from school for fewer days just by simple hand washing. So the advice from our grandparents and parents rings true up to today. Just by simple hand washing, um, they found that they were staying home for fewer days and they actually looked at the number of germs and there were fewer germs on their hands. The New York Times yesterday had a report that no healthy child should be excluded from school or allowed to miss school time because of head lice or nits. So it's time that we educate our, our principals and teachers that some of the schools that have a no knit policy before children return to school, that should be abandoned. So no, no child should miss one day at school because of nits or head lice. So it's something that should be recognized, should be treated. Of course, we're seeing a lot of resistance to head lice and we know that it can be um, widely seen, but regardless of your social status, so it's not an illness that is necessarily a marker um, that a home is um, infected or dirty. It's something that can infect an entire class. It doesn't mean that you have to stay away from school. It should be recognized and treated appropriately by the physician. And hopefully thoughtful principals and school mistresses and masters will be able to deal with that accordingly. The BBC had an interesting re report um, over the weekend that more than a million doses of a particular antibiotic was dropped by the World Health Organization in Madagascar. So viewers, viewers might think of Madagascar, but that's a movie. Who knew that it was actually a place? Southeastern part of Africa, there's a huge island called Madagascar, which, and there has been an outbreak of plague. So that plague, which can be spread by rats and flies, but this, this sort, sort of plague is actually a pneumonic one that is spread from the lungs by droplets in the atmosphere and it has killed at least 33 people. The authorities there have also banned prison visits because it's, um, it's thought that the risk of spreading this particular germ, this bacterium is highest in unsanitary and crowded jails there. So it has been thought that, so over the last two months, there have been 230 persons infected with a plague. So it's not something that's relegated yet to the history books. Viewers would also remember the Black Death um, in the 1340s in Eurasia. That was attributed to the plague, maybe from rats and a lack of sanitation there. But this one is spread by droplets, especially the pneumonic type of infections. 230 persons infected so far in two months. And uh, we want to congratulate the World Health Organization for finally acting because there has been quite a, um, a lot of criticism as the Government has acted very slowly in dealing with this outbreak, this surge in the incidence of plague in Madagascar. The 2017 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine has been awarded to three researchers in the United States who studied the clocks, the body clocks. And the medical term for this is circadian rhythm. So it's a fascinating field. And their work illuminates some of the genes. So these genes which tend to wax and wane, these genes that handle the molecular workings of the body clocks. And they allow the bodies to respond to some of the needs and the demands at the different times of the day and night. So it's a fascinating field. The use of the body clocks and circadian rhythms and congratulations to the researchers who have been awarded a Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. And that is usually out of Stockholm in Sweden. Some of the hormones in the body, um, these messengers which are produced by glands and are transported in the bloodstream, many of the hormones tend to have that sort of rhythm where there are certain times of the day in which the levels may be surging, they may be highest, 
and then they may be lower in the night. Fascinating field of research and science into circadian rhythms. And that was marked by a paper that showed that night shift work. So those night shift workers had an increased risk of gaining weight. And that link was noticed especially among permanent night shift workers. So they looked at those who were permanent night shift workers against rotating night shift workers and found that the chance of becoming overweight, the chance of gaining weight, and all the complications of obesity was increased in permanent night shift workers. And perhaps the reason may rest in the body clocks or circadian rhythms. There was a fascinating case last week from the British Medical Journal of a man who was thought to have lung cancer, but apparently it was due to a toy traffic cone. So when they did the surgery and they removed that mass, which was in his lung, now he was a smoker, but he had swallowed a toy traffic cone in 1974, and there was a mass in his lung. So just a reminder that although we may cough and splutter and we get rid of these things, children can actually choke and they can actually find that parts like toys, and in this case, um, it was a traffic cone, it can actually stay within the lung for years and create symptoms associated with the respiratory tract, such as a shortness of breath or a chronic cough. Staying in the United Kingdom, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, so we know that's a particularly nasty form, um, an unpleasant form um, of arthritis, which can be um, marked by stiffness in the morning, painful swollen joints, especially of the hands, but it can affect any joint in the body. And it can be multi-organ too. It can affect your eyes, your lungs, your kidneys, and so forth too. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis who were smokers would double the risk for hospitalization for a heart attack and stroke versus those who had never smoked. So rheumatoid arthritis is one of those medical illnesses in which antibodies are attacking joints. So we know that there are some of those in which antibodies normally would be fighting off infections, but there are some illnesses, some of the diseases in which antibodies attack good things. In this case, um, antibodies affecting the joints. And if you smoke with rheumatoid arthritis, you have an extremely high chance for having a heart attack or stroke. So it creates uh, a, an environment or milieu of inflammation to the lining of the arteries. So as usual, a little bit of cricket news. So the West Indies team, so after a fairly unsuccessful tour of England, that same team will be off to Zimbabwe for two test matches. We wish them all the best. And there is a charity T20 game at the Queen's Park Oval in Trinidad. And that's an attempt to raise funds for hurricane victims. So if you're interested, it's on Saturday the 14th and you definitely want to support the the players, so it's a local game in which the Red Force will be playing the rest of the West Indies in a T20 game. And of course, these nail-biting games, but we know that it affects your heart, and there have been anecdotal re reports and stories of persons who had heart attacks with some of these games. Well, over the last week in the United States, there was a health check for hockey fans, so one of the hockey teams, you know, during the excitement of watching games, they actually looked at their heart rates and found that whether you were there at the stadium or in person or you were watching on the television, they found that a heart rate can dramatically increase. So in fact, it can even be doubled. Now, of course, this does not replace working out. So don't think, well, all right, my heart rate was, was speeding up while I was watching the game. But it's time that we replace being spectators, and it's time that we become players. Or the walking, running, jogging, biking, and zooming, which I'm, which I'm an advocate for on this show, we have to ensure that that forms a daily part of our routine in trying to combat all the deleterious effects of obesity. In closing this segment of the medical news, we usually have the medicine corner and let food be thy medicine as part of our Healthy Lifestyles team. Once more, congratulations to the Trinidad and Tobago Medical Association on their annual research conference. And that theme was on the metabolic syndrome and obesity. 
It was twinned with a fantastic expo on diabetes, and that was held with the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago at the Center of Excellence last weekend. Congratulations to all the organizers, speakers, and presenters at both symposia. Some of the tips for healthy eating, as you know, we're going into the holiday period. It's your Diwali time, then into Christmas. I know it's Thanksgiving as well, too, Monday the 9th of October in Canada. Next month, Thanksgiving in the United States. These constant feasts can affect our weight for the entire year. So limit your portion sizes, try to avoid snacking, and choose wisely if you're at a buffet. Don't skip meals so that you're ravenous when you're ready to eat on an evening and avoid lingering at the table, and especially the carbohydrates and sweets, that deadly roti, that parata or your boss up shot roti. Focus more on the vegetables. They've also found too in some of the research in the last week that going without breakfast, so if you skip breakfast in the morning, it was substantially associated with an increased risk of developing clogged arteries. So that well-known aphorism to eat like a king in the morning, like a prince for lunch, and like a pauper in the evening holds true. So they're seeing that in so many scientific studies. It was heartening to see that our local first lady, Mrs. Rima Carmona, recently spoke at a UN meeting about the perils of unhealthy eating. And she also tackled with a scourge of childhood obesity at that conference. Maybe it's high time that global food policy needs to shift away from focusing on feeding people to nourishing people with healthy diets. The diets rich in fruits, vegetables, peas and beans, low-fat dairy, fish, and low salt. That's the sort of theme that we want to be looking at. It, it has been said too, it has been said by researchers worldwide that poor eating habits are responsible for more of the global health burden than sex, drug, smoking, and alcohol combined. The risks of obesity-related cancer increased um, over the last decade, and it's been thought that 13 types of cancer are linked to this obesity epidemic, and some of the cancers may include colorectal, prostate, breast, pancreas, stomach, and liver. Having high blood pressure in the middle of the life was associated with an increased risk for memory issues in women, and high sugar intake increases the amount of liver fat in men. And we're seeing that trend as the world becomes more westernized. There was, um, so another article in the New York Times last week showing that the advent or the introduction of KFC into Ghana, so that's another one of the countries in Africa, the introduction of KFC has turned out to be bad for the population there because the fried chicken and fries have combined to balloon that rate of increasing size and obesity by 650%. So the incidence of um, obesity has increased by 650% since 1980 with the introduction of KFC in Ghana. So we know there are 800 million people worldwide who are hungry, but 2 billion people are struggling with their weight. They're overweight. So some food for thought, no pun intended. Let's take a short break. And when we return, we'll take your calls on the open forum of Doctor in the House. Stay with us. High blood pressure is as dangerous as an overpumped balloon. Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. Microlife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. Microlife AFib screams for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. Microlife, a partner for people, 
make her life. Milkana butter, an experience for your taste buds. Smooth, flavor-filled, rich, velvety butter. Milkana butter for cakes, pastries, pies, or just place it in any of your favorite dishes and add that rich buttery taste to all your meals. Why choose another? Look for the butter with flavor, the butter with the creamy richness in taste. Milkana butter, distributed by N.M. Ghani, 2003 Limited, Number one, Industrial Lean Charflair. Sheik Leisha Limited, the lead in manufacturers of vermicelli split peas powder and grease proof paper. We also manufacture a variety of paper and plastic bags. We have bags for French fries, sandwiches, popcorn, supermarkets, stores, and much more. Whatever your needs, trust Sheik Leisha Limited for quality products. Sheik Leisha Limited, Warrenville, Konupia, telephone 665-3336. Welcome back to Doctor in the House. And usually at this point, um, it's the lighter side, but I wanted to start to do with a video from Finland. So it's emanating from Finland about some of the dangers of alcohol and how children view us. So as we know, we'll be moving soon um, so into a season which involves um, more indulgence. We spoke about food, but another thing that may be a factor may include alcohol. Let's have a look. What you're about to see might just be the creepiest and most terrifying public service announcement anywhere in the world right now. is currently running in Finland. It's been made by a charity called the Fragile Childhood. It's meant to highlight the harm caused to children when parents drink too much. So it's a reminder, it's a grim reminder about not just the, the, the way that children will view adults, but a reminder that they are watching us and they're emulating and they're absorbing some of the negative habits of adults. We spoke about the parliamentarians and some of the behavioral patterns that we continue to see in parliament and subsequently some of the, some of the issues which have been emanating from our nation's schools. 
So it's a bit on the lighter side now, though, as we have some of the videos which hopefully you don't experience these when you go to the hospital or to the doctor's office. Let's have a look. Yeah, vicious little things, squirrels, aren't they? Yeah. Oh. Right, now I just need to take your blood pressure. OK. <clears throat> ah, yes, 135 over 85. Or might be lower. 120 over 60. Yeah, something like that. Nothing to worry about. Oh. Probably. Uh, shouldn't you use the, 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 the squeezy pumping machine? No, I never do. Uh, this method is proven to put me exactly in the sort of area where I need to be getting the sort of numbers I'd like to hear. Great. Would you like me to take another reading? Yes, please. Put your mind at rest. That would be good. Yeah, you see, I'm getting almost the same reading there. Right, OK. I mean, if we average out the two. Is there no way to be more specific? Would it help if I were to perhaps take a temperature? OK. 98.6, approximately. There's a chance of fractured fibula. Given him a mild Saturday. So he could be able to go on tomorrow. Daddy's gonna be so excited. That killed him. Paging doctor. Certainly the lighter side of life at the doctor's office and at the hospital. Let's Take a short break. Stay with us. It's time for the Open Forum on Doctor in the House. At times I feel that the sun is hidden by a hazy sky. A God's gift brought straight from the farm to your plate. Jazza rice with its premium range of basmati rice. Helping you prepare your perfect mouth-watering dishes just as you planned. Jazza rice. Blessings in each plate. Every now and then we need... This is a Pakistani product. And all over the world, at least try it once. And if it's good, please let us know. We need your encouragement. Just a little time to breathe. Welcome back to Doctor in the House. But just a reminder too that we're live on Monday nights, but there's a rerun on Saturday afternoons at 1 p.m. We're also streaming live on the website, but the IBN website and on YouTube as well at Master IBN Master. So if you put that in um, on your search, you should be able to access a live streaming of Doctor in the House or in the future as well. So the phone, the phone lines are now open and the numbers should be appearing on your screen very shortly. 
While we await our first call, I would also like to welcome the members of the studio audience, Sat Budram and Dr. Neela Ramdas Tilak Singh. And some birthday greetings out to, to my sister, Angelica Rachel. She celebrates hers on October the 26th. God's blessings to you, and I wish you many more. And some birthday wishings belatedly as well, too, to Miss Chedi Singh Ambrose from Lunch Park, one of, the, one of the faithful viewers of the show. And some greetings, too, to Mrs. Dhanraji Sonny from McBean, and Shanti Bali from Tortuga. So some of the viewers as well too who say that they don't miss the show. The Pampilon family from Santa Cruz um, are all locked in. I know some of the girls are visiting too. And the matriarch there, Mrs. Petra Pampilon, is one of our firm fans. My aunt Pamela is also having her birthday on the 25th. Janine, Mrs. Mohammed. Chedi from all the way down in Faisabad. Those are all birthday girls in the month of October. And we certainly want to wish God's blessings to one and all. Let's take our first caller for the evening. Hello, and we go down to Central to Kuva. Good evening and welcome to the show. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for joining us, sir. You're on the air. Right. What I'd like to find out, sir, is whenever yeah. I come about for the movement, my wife, I don't get anything. Yes. I don't see anything on the therapy. Part. Right. Is that a, that a problem? Have you noticed any blood or mucus, oh. or have you noticed a change in your patterns when you have a bowel movement now? There is no blood. But the okay. Changes, but it usually right. get a little problem. I have a press. Hmm? I have a push a little more. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for that call. Since we know that our misuse affecting the large intestine or the colon are very prevalent, some of the complications there. And uh, in fact, it has been recommended that all persons over the age of 50 should have a colonoscopy done. So as a screening test to look for growths, for polyps, and even for cancers of the colon. It's one of, it's one of the malignancies, one of the cancers associated with obesity um, and increased intake of red meat. And there is also a genetic predisposition to colorectal cancer. Now, having, having a complete um, emptying of your bowels, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is a worrying symptom. So in fact, I would say that um, a lot of persons may find that that varies. When you wipe, if you're not seeing blood or mucus, that's excellent. And, um, but a change in your bowel habit. So if your doctor does blood tests and your blood count is low, um, sometimes some individuals notice blood had mixed with stool. You may certainly want to have that checked out. Your doctor may want to refer you to see a specialist, a gastroenterologist, um, to consider doing a colonoscopy if you haven't. So I don't think now that there's any need for worry based on the symptoms that you've described, but chat with your physician, especially if you've noticed an altered bowel habit, um, since that may be one of the worrying symptoms in persons over the age of 50. But what a good question to open the batting on this segment of the show. But just a reminder, when you're patched into the studio to mute your television set and listen on the telephone, we have another call, and this time from Charlieville. Good evening and welcome to the show. Hello? Hello? Right, it sounds like we're having some issues there with the phone lines, but just a reminder that the studio lines are 645-4426 or 663-8373. We'd love to hear from you. This is your time, so it's an ideal opportunity. If you haven't, um, if you haven't been able to chat with your physician or you just want um, a gentle nudge in the right sort of direction, we'd be happy to help where we can. Just a disclaimer, too, on this show that we don't attempt to diagnose, to manage, or treat any specific illness, but just some, some advice based on the telephone call. And usually, with a volume of calls which we have on the open forum, um, we will just ask you to state your question, and then afterwards, you can listen on the television set. Right, so let's go down to the Southland. Caller from Princess Town, good evening, and welcome to Doctor in the House. 
Hello. Good evening, doctor. Good evening to... How are you? The doyen of diabetes. Madam Diabetes, as I like to call you, Auntie Zuby. Thank you for joining us, ma'am. <laughs> Wonderful program as usual. Thank you. Um, can you explain what is flatbush diabetes? Flatbush diabetes, right. So I know that you have been one of the advocates for um, education, and I know that's one of the one of the thrusts of not just the Diabetes Association locally, but worldwide at IDF. And uh, we know that when we're speaking about the classification of diabetes, many of the viewers would know about type 1 of diabetes, type 2, or gestational diabetes, type 1 of diabetes. And I'm just saying this for, this, for the um, sake of the viewers, but type 1 of diabetes may be seen in uh, sometimes younger persons, although it may occur at any age, younger, slimmer individuals, and once more it involves the antibodies. We were speaking about rheumatoid arthritis involving antibodies attacking the joints. In this case, antibodies may attack the pancreas, and that may be seen in certain families. Type 1 diabetes, in which you have a lack of insulin, you have a deficiency of insulin, and it requires the administration of insulin to be life-saving. Type 2 diabetes is, is, of course, far more common. 90% of the diabetic population may have type 2, in which is marked by resistance to insulin, in which you may not have a deficiency of insulin, but as a result of obesity and a burgeoning epidemic of obesity, the person now has insulin resistance. You may find that they're hypertensive and their lipid levels are high, and they are two to three times more likely to have a heart attack and stroke, and all the complications are there for both of the major types of diabetes. Gestational is a type you get when you're pregnant, so as a result of changes in hormones, if you're obese, you have your polycystic ovaries, a family history, or certain races, and there may be resolution of the blood sugar following the pregnancy. Although those women, 50% of them will eventually have type 2 diabetes. Now, there's another type that doesn't really fit into the classical um, sections like type 1, type 2, gestational. You have some rarer types. You have some types in which children may, may have types in which they're able to get away with tablets, and that can manage their sugar levels beautifully. And these are actually linked to certain genes. You may have some of the adults which find that they have antibodies. They're not fitting a type 1 sort of picture, but they're adults and require insulin. There was a type that was seen, J-type of diabetes, flat bush. Some people refer to it as type 1 and a half or type 3 diabetes. And it was seen in, in a black population in places like the United States. And even when I was in the United Kingdom, it was recognized there, especially with some of the persons of West Indian extraction, in which you may be admitted to hospital with Diabetic emergencies, but diabetic emergencies, your sugar levels are very high. And some individuals may have antibodies, they may have abnormal antibodies which are affecting the pancreas, but they may also retain secretion of insulin. So you send them home on insulin, you said, okay, your sugars are extremely high, you've had an emergency. You send them home on insulin, and then they're readmitted or they come back to clinic saying um, that their sugar levels are actually quite low. You stop their medications and find that there seems to be almost a resolution of their diabetes. So it's a link to changes, it's linked to certain genes. There certainly are a genetic blend there, which would be going on. Um, so it's just a reminder that we have certain types of diabetes. The management may be different. Most persons, we may want to think maybe type 1 or type 2, but one size doesn't fit all. And um, doctors and healthcare workers must be cognizant of that, of that fact that we may see an older person who may be obese, and we're naturally assuming that they're type 2, but they may actually have um, a few, few other things um, that might be going on. We may see a child and assume that he or she is a type 1 diabetic, but it may not necessarily be so. But great question there. We stay in the south. This time we move to Santa Flora. Good evening and welcome to Doctor in the House. Hello? Yeah. 
Good evening, sir. Thank you for joining us. You're on the air. Uh, better to listen on your telephone, sir. Hello? Hello? Yeah? Welcome to Dr. Rene House. You're on the air. But do you have a question for us? Hi, uh, Doctor. I'll spend some time in... Good afternoon. Hello, yes, spend... sir. Yes, so spend some time in the hospital. Yes. Hello? We we yes. are hearing you, yes. Go on. Yes, Doctor, I'll spend some time in the hospital under your care. Yes. And you were so good on your staff. I always wanted to tell you thank you for your kind gesture and your staff for taking good care of me in the hospital. Blessings, blessings. That's wonderful news. Thank you so much for taking the time to call in. Um, yes, yes, the doctors and them were oh my God. I have no regrets for the little time I spent in the hospital. I spent almost about six weeks under the doctor care, Dr. Tila Singh and his staff. Yes. Well, and well, I will course. certainly extend your best wishes and congratulations to my team. Thank you for that. And it's indeed a blessing to hear from you, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Victor Osborne. I'm from ah, Florida. Yes. Flora. yes. Thank All you. Right. Thank yeah, you for yeah. calling in. So and enjoy the rest of your evening. It's, it's always a delight to get a call like that. And despite all the negative things that we hear said about the public health sector, it's, it's, it's really a refreshing thing to hear a call. And thank you again, Mr. Osborne. Right, so let's take another call from Karanaj. Good evening and welcome to the show. Yeah, uh, hello, doctor. Good night. Thank you for joining us, ma'am. You're on the air. Yes, hello, good night. Hello. But I like to find out, even though you're taking your pressure tablet, why your pressure keeps going up so right. high. Okay. And even though you change your eating habits. Yes. Thank you very much for that. As hypertension or high blood pressure is another one of the epidemics. And I've briefly alluded to it during the news that we know that 90 percent of persons, we may not find a reason for why they are hypertensive. So although in the West Indies, many persons find that they have a genetic predisposition, just as with diabetes. This, this is driven a lot of times by the obesity epidemic too. High blood sugar, high blood pressure, cholesterol issues may be associated with what we call the metabolic syndrome. But there are 10% of persons who may have a secondary reason for why their blood pressure is high. So you can't assume that it's only due to lifestyle with a low salt diet. And we speak about um, some of the dietary approaches to stop in hypertension involving fruits and vegetables, peas and beans and low fat foods and fish. Um, we know that salt is a four-letter word in hypertension. You want to be vigilant about that, and you want to be exercising as well. 30 to 60 minutes per day of some sort of physical activity. If you chat with your doctor and it's safe to do so, you want to ensure that that forms the cornerstone. Lifestyle changes are the cornerstones in your management for any chronic medical condition. But there are certain individuals who may have certain hormonal issues, there may be issues with blood flow to the kidneys. Perhaps there may be issues with sleep in which you're not getting enough oxygen and those factors are driving up your blood pressure. Some persons use some remedies over the counter, particularly pain medications or some of the tablets for colds and sinus issues. And those have been often associated with, with life-threatening blood pressure issues. Most of the individuals with high blood pressure find that one and two drugs may not be enough. So in fact, when they've looked at studies of persons worldwide, and I'm speaking about hundreds of thousands of hypertensive patients throughout the world, they may find that they need to be on two or more drugs to control their blood pressure. Many of which may find that in a West Indian sort of population, that blacks may find that certain classes of drugs may work better than in a white population. So that's also something that should be factored into the equation in the management of a hypertensive patient. So you're targeting for most of the population maybe less than 140 or 90 as being a good goal to prevent the complications of high blood pressure like heart attacks, strokes, 
kidney failure, bleeding to the eyes, blockages to the arteries in the legs and so forth. But there are some recent studies that will be, will be released, I would think, over the next few years that may actually say that a blood pressure under 130, 130 over 80 may be a goal for hypertension. But it's something to sit down and chat with your doctor about whether or not there's something else that's driving up your blood pressure, whether or not you can do some self-examination, some of the over-the-counter drugs. Perhaps you may need some investigations or tests, and perhaps some amendments to the classes of drugs used to control your blood pressure may be on the cards. So we head to the east now for our next caller, Arima. And I know that the first People's Day will be celebrated there. Good evening and welcome to Doctor in the House. Thank you for joining us, sir. You're on the air. Good evening and welcome to Doctor in the House. Yes, good doctor. Good night. Thank you for joining us. Yes, um, what I wanted to ask you, I want to ask two questions. Certainly. What? Yes, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. You go right ahead. Yes, Listen on the uh, telephone. What one can do is to have one has um, cervical, cervical spondylosis. Spondylosis, right. Cervical spondylosis. Spondylosis. Right. And what causes it? What causes um, the popping in the air? You know, you have the popping in the air. Mm, right. What, uh, what causes that? Yes. Thank you very much for those two pertinent questions, and very common too. Cervical spondylosis, sometimes um, it may be noted if your doctor has sent you for an x-ray or a scan, so of the neck. So the spine, um, the, the spine is often um, given names, and that part in the neck that starts from the base of the brain to the neck is called the cervical spine. And it's an area that really takes a lot of pressure during the course of a lifetime. You're bending, you're flexing, you're sleeping awkwardly. And wear and tear or degenerative changes to those bones and joints can sometimes create what is called cervical spondylosis. Sometimes there may be even impingement of a nerve. Persons may find that they get the radiation of pain down their arm. Cervical spondylosis is often managed to do without surgery, conservatively, perhaps with physiotherapy, so the doctor may, may actually recommend seeing a physiotherapist or doing certain neck, neck exercises to strengthen the joints and the muscles, the ligaments that may be found in the neck area. And so if there's impingement of the nerve, there may be certain medications that could be recommended for that. But that's something to chat with your physician about as to how to appropriately manage. Um, some of the neurosurgeons are often asked to um, ad advise patients with particularly unpleasant symptoms, but I think most of them should be managed without surgery. It's very common, um, apart from the pain and apart from some of the issues such as nerve impingement, some people actually feel the room spinning around them, the sensation of um, dizziness, so as a result of spondylosis. The popping in the air can be one of those the symptoms as a result of another tube in the air. So, so the air, and I know that um, Dr. Juman is back who is the foremost airs, nose, and throat specialist on this show. Um, but you have the outer air, the middle, and inner air. There's a tube called the eustachian tube that often serves to balance pressure, but to equalize the pressure inside the air. And sometimes it can be issues with that tube, so there may be blockages there. Persons find that it can actually pop at different um, occasions when, they, when they're um, in a plane, when they're in an aeroplane, as a result of changes in the atmospheric pressure that they may actually feel their airs pop. It's hard to actually say what might be the reason for that or what might be the treatment, but I'd recommend that your doctor at least um, looks into the air, that he does an examination, just to make sure that there may not be more reasons for that, the popping in the air. There are some of the medications too, perhaps if there's fluid in the air, some infections, some medications may be recommended for that. But seeing your primary care, doctor first, and perhaps a referral to an ears, nose, and throat specialist if your symptoms become particularly troublesome. We return to Central, this time to Coover again. Good evening and welcome to the show. Hello? Hello? 
Good yes, evening and thank you for joining us. Good night, Doctor. You're on the air. Okay. Yes, what I want to find out, I am diabetic. Yes. And uh, I am hypertensive. But my cholesterol is always high. Right. It is 250. And I am on Simvastin. Mm hmm so I don't know what's the problem there. Right. So that, that is frequently seen. And I know that we have been speaking about this metabolic syndrome, which is driven by fat around the tummy. And you often find that there is a cluster of things happening in the same patient. Type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol issues. Now, a big fraction of that, a big fraction of your... Um, cholesterol is due to genes. It is genetic. In fact, it has been estimated that about 80% would be genetic. 20% may be lifestyle. So the liver is the factory for your cholesterol. So we need it. It's a soft, waxy substance. It forms a vital part of our cell membranes and hormones and even vitamin D. So you need it for life. So it is essential. The problem is when it starts accumulating in arteries, as we know, it remains one of the risk factors along with inflammation that triggers inflammation to arteries and can cause strokes and heart attacks. So it may not be that you're having issues with your diet or so a lack of exercise. In fact, some persons are as thin as whips and find that they've been exercising, they're fit as fiddles and still their levels are very high and they find that they need a class of drugs, and you mentioned one, which is freely available as part of the CTAP program, simvastatin. Having said that, if you're a diabetic, there have been large studies worldwide, and many of the recommendations all over the world continue to say that persons who are diabetic, especially if you're 40 to 75 years old, you should be on a statin to, to not just lower numbers of the cholesterol, but it also lowers your chance of having a heart attack or stroke. So you are using it for protection. Some of the individuals who may need these statin drugs, and often we hear all these fears about statins, that it will damage my liver, it may cause um, a whole host of adverse effects, and many of these are unfounded. Many of these fears are unfounded. Statins are definitely indicated in persons who have had a heart attack or stroke. If you have had blockages to the arteries in your legs, if you've had an aneurysm perhaps, you should be on a drug to lower cholesterol, not just for numbers. You're using it for protection, you're using it for prevention. And that's one of the thrusts on this show as well. Certain persons may find too that if the bad type of the cholesterol, the low density lipoprotein, exceeds 190. So when you do your total level of the cholesterol, you mentioned that yours was 250. Your doctor is also wanting to ensure that if the low density lipoprotein exceeds 190, he may want to think about a statin drug, so that's indicated there. And for diabetics, you're trying to keep that bad type of the cholesterol under 100. Preferably if you've had um, a heart attack or stroke, under 70. So watching those numbers, some of the guidelines say that maybe we don't need to be so vigilant, but I still like to know them. I still like to know that patients are using their drugs, and it's also a useful guide for the doctor and for the patient to know that their numbers are going in the right direction. So the phone lines are burning up. We go next to Ruka. Good evening and welcome to the show. Hello? Hello? Oh, I think we lost our caller there. So I'd like to um, advise that if you want to give us a call, it's the open forum um, of the doctor in the house. The phone lines are burning up and some of the tips for healthy living. We've spoken about quite a few and we're ranging not just um, from the metabolic syndrome. It's not only about a metabolic syndrome, but we're also speaking about uh, many of the health issues and challenges that you may be facing on a daily basis. We go next to, to the Southland, to my former hometown in Siparia. Good evening and welcome to the show. Hello, good night. Thank you for joining us, ma'am. Thank you. 
Um, the question I have is mm -hmm. concerning, um, well, your brain cells. Yes. I had a cousin. She went and did a test called a MRA. Yes. And they told her that um, they're seeing where some of her brain cells are going. Could you explain that? Okay. So thank you very much for that. Since as we're seeing an aging population as a result of all the good social and health and economic policies worldwide, we're seeing an aging population now. And we're going to be seeing our misuse with shrinkage in the brain and some of these scans and maybe memory issues, some of the dementia cases that, that we note nationwide would be linked with loss of brain cells. It, it would be hard to actually see that on a scan since cells are microscopic. Um, but maybe what might be noted on a scan, so especially an MRI scan or a CT scan, perhaps maybe shrinkage of the brain. And in conjunction with some of the signs and symptoms, you may be able to consider whether or not that person may be at risk for memory issues that can run in families and there may be certain risks for different types of memory problems. Um, <clears throat> not everyone who has a loss of short-term memory, meaning that you remember things from the distant past, but recent events seem to have evaporated from your mind, many persons may not have what is the so-called classic Alzheimer's type of dementia. There are different types in which you may have silent small strokes in the brain that may be noted on a scan. And this may be one of the contributing factors towards vascular types of your dementia. So persons who have had strokes, they may also have shrinkage in the brain, and the risk factors include those aspects of the metabolic syndrome that I mentioned, diabetes, high blood pressure, your cholesterol being high, smoking, um, obesity, a sedentary lifestyle, a family history, and so forth. There may be issues. You may also want to check a vitamin B12 level. It's a blood test. The doctor may want to check a thyroid function. And many persons with memory issues should be screened. In fact, I would say all persons with memory issues should be screened for the scourge of depression. Some of the individuals whom you're assuming may be demented or having issues with their brain, you, you, they may be actually struggling with depression. Some foods may help. A lot of people speak about fish. So a lot of people speak about exercise and a healthy lifestyle, not just helping your heart and lowering your chance for strokes, but also helping memory issues. So that can certainly improve um, the, the risk of short-term memory loss. It can certainly reduce that. But that's a splendid question indeed, because we are seeing so many patients with memory problems. It's hard, it's hard to on a scan, as I said, to speak about loss of brain cells, but it can be, but there may be certain changes that may be predicted based on a scan. Back into the east to Dabadi. Good evening and welcome. Hello? Hello, thank you for joining yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah, Doc. Um, yeah, hello, good night. Yeah, good evening. Thank you. Um, what happened is that um, I did a cholesterol test about six months ago and I was diagnosed with about 210. And I'd like to know what, what diet, what food is uh, taking down the cholesterol level, what things. So I find that I'm in a urine, I find that I'm in the ear You were diagnosed? Sugar, whatever. Sugar was high on your last blood test. You were diagnosed with diabetes? Yes. Hi. Hello? No, I wasn't diagnosed with diabetes. There's a feedback on the phone. So when you did your blood test to do, I mean, yes. you listen on your telephone, when you did the blood test, but what did they find when you did your blood test? Well, a few it was months normal. Ago. I wasn't diagnosed with no sugar or anything. So right. just my cholesterol was a little concerned, you know, a little high, but Right, okay. I did that fit me. I did that whole thorough analysis now. Great. And everything was reading all right. Great. When you left okay. my cholesterol, the doctor said it was a little concerned, so he permitted there would be cheese and milk. Right, okay. Thank you very much for that call. So, and once more, it's a reminder about the value for diet and exercise. So avoidance of the fried, greasy, the fatty foods and foods high in saturated fat you may want to be watchful about. But a big chunk of this, a big chunk of this, at least on the research and the evidence which, which has been done abroad, 
Um, a big chunk of that is genetic. So you can be very good with your lifestyle changes, but you may find that your genes may be driving up the level of the cholesterol. Some persons find that they may need a medication for that. So I would advise too that you chat with your doctor about whether or not there may be secondary causes for a high level of the cholesterol. Simply stated, an um, thyroid issues, an underactive thyroid gland or hypothyroidism may cause the body to produce more of the cholesterol. Certain issues with the liver and the kidneys, you said that those were clear. There are medications that can also predispose somebody to high levels of fats in the body. So sitting down with your doctor and making sure that there isn't a secondary cause. Diabetes, obesity, so if you imbibe a lot of alcohol, thyroid issues, kidney and liver problems may be included on that list for secondary causes. One of the callers asked about high blood pressure and we spoke about secondary causes for hypertension. But once more, one size doesn't fit all in management. So we can't just say, well, okay, but here's a prescription, take a statin drug and go. Uh, maybe we need to be more thoughtful, we need to be circumspect, see if there is a secondary cause before prescribing um, a drug appropriately. But it makes, um, it, it, it certainly wouldn't hurt to include healthy lifestyles as one of the changes for this year. We stay in the East, Taruka. Good evening and welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Doctor. Very, very informative program and must congratulate you on your excellent program. We look forward to listening to you. What a pleasure, sir. Thank you for joining us. Um, I want to look at a topic back to cholesterol. Yes. A recent article out of America indicates that cholesterol is no longer the culprit. Yes. I want you to comment on that. Thank you very much for that. And also, yes. could you advise the public on some of the foods which can cause an elevated cholesterol? Because a lot of patients ask, Doc, could I eat zabuka? Yes. Could I eat the yellow of the egg? Yes. So it's a bit confusing now. We've been seeing that so much in the profession. And I know that you are one of the leaders in the East there, um, so a close friend and one of, one of my advisors as well too, but Dr. Mahabir, Vinod Mahabir, well known in Aruka and, in, and well respected in circles in the medical profession. That's the problem though with many of the recommendations and the guidelines that there is so much conflicting information out there that that is not just the patients are confused, but, but the doctors are, the healthcare workers are as well. Um, just a few months ago in Europe, there was a meeting involving heart specialists. So it was the European cardiology meeting in Spain, in Barcelona. And there was the launch of a study. The results of a study was released called a PURE study, looking at more than 100,000 persons in many countries in the world, showing that some of the changes in the diets may not be what was conventionally taught, may not be as deleterious as we believed. <clears throat> a high carb, that's a diet high in starches. We spoke about things like rice, roti, pasta, potatoes. A high carb and high sugar form of diet seems to be more harmful than some of the fatty foods, so in the diet. So that's a bit of a paradox because it goes against what we've been taught. And it's a reminder though that the triggers for atherosclerosis is not just one factor. There are multiple triggers for blockages in the arteries. There are multiple risk factors for why somebody may have a heart attack and stroke. It's not just your cholesterol. It involves diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking and so forth, and obesity. So it involves tackling multiple factors in the same person. That's why I keep mentioning this term, the metabolic syndrome, which is a cluster of risk factors in the same person. So for now, many of the scientists and the researchers seem to be um, demonizing sugar and carbohydrates. We spoke about eggs, we spoke about the fact that nowadays 
um, an egg per day may actually be healthy. Some of the recent studies are showing that maybe it's not necessary to have low-fat milk, but those things are changing. It's based on the fact that we don't have as, as many studies for some of these things in lifestyle. Because a lot of the companies, a lot of the pharmaceutical firms will tend to pump money so into their um, studies involving their drugs and medications because obviously it's, it's to their financial benefit. We don't have as many studies as this one that was launched recently in Barcelona called the Pure Study. We don't have a lot of that. Maybe it's time we did a lot more re research. In terms of avocados, butter from God is what I like to call it, and I know my mother was, was one of the persons who coined that term, God's butter, in terms of avocados, because you have good type of fat as well. So in terms of eggs, in terms of your, your milk as well, too, I don't think we need to worry too much about it anymore. So although I myself avoid the yellow still, but it doesn't mean that, I mean, it doesn't mean that we have scientific facts to back up a lot of the things of what we see when it comes to diet. The problem when it comes to blockages in the arteries, inflammation. Inflammation is the trigger, and those risk factors are the ones that you need to sit down and ensure that you are not at risk for having a heart attack and stroke. Nowadays, even having your tea and your coffee and so on too. Some studies in the last week showing that having two to three cups of coffee per day is actually healthy, which actually goes against the green for medical advice, let's say 20 or 30 years ago. So fascinating information, and I'm sure that we're seeing so many paradigm shifts in modern medicine. And who knows, maybe in a few years' time, we will sit on this show so and actually say, but you know, the evidence has actually changed now. Perhaps some of the foods that we were recommending in days of old, maybe those foods are actually harmful. But for now, I would say that it's time to return to a simpler past a simpler period in the nation with fruits, vegetables, peas, and beans, and avoiding highly processed, high-fat, high-carb, and sugary foods. We go to the Southland, to Hi. Gasparillo. Good evening and welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Hello, you're on the air. Hello. Yes. Thank you oh, for joining like, us. Yeah. As I was talking about the obesity, yes. I want to know things. Well, I'm 12 years, old, 12 years old. Thank you for calling, and welcome. And how? And I to lose the weight mm -hmm. because my camera have money diet right now. Great. But I'm still not losing the weight. All right. Thank you very much for taking the time to call in. Since we're seeing a lot more of this obesity, especially in children, and you may find that um, apart from the fact that there may be some of the psychological effects but some of the problems in school, you may also find that some of the health issues that we discussed, you would be at an increased chance for getting it. And um, well, I love the fact that you're following a healthy diet that we've been speaking about throughout the show. So I want to congratulate you for that, sir. And I hope that you include exercise as well, too. Um, make sure that you're running, you're walking, you're jogging or biking. Maybe you may want to take your parents um, or your grandparents or guardians so that you can get some sort of exercise. So include that as part of your schoolwork. Include that as part, um, as part of your, your work at school or at home. So you're trying to do about 30 to 60 minutes per day. It can be very hard to with certain individuals because weight gain is not just about food. We know that sometimes when you're struggling with your size, so it could be something that you've inherited from your family. So if you have large parents or grandparents, you are more likely to be big. Some of the hormones, too, as you're 12 years old, you know, you're growing through growth changes. You're going through something called puberty. It's a changing time so in which your voice will start to deepen. Maybe you will get um, so the growth of beard and certain changes as well to it here, here growth in different parts of your body. So there are changes with your hormones and let your 
parents or guardians, chat with your doctor, apart from the diet and exercise, maybe to look for some of the changes with hormones that might be found, um, whether or not there may be another reason for why it is that you have gained weight. So the diet and exercise, I want to say well done for that, and I wish you God's blessings in fighting the scourge and fighting all the problems of obesity staying away from sugary drinks, staying away from snacks and food. Maybe, um, maybe it's time that the government as well to implement some of the taxes and some of the restrictions in grappling with childhood obesity. So we go next to Morva for our final call for the evening. Thank you for joining us. You're on the air. Dr. Zilatri, nice. Sire, what a pleasure to hear your voice, sir. <laughs> what a pleasure, but you have made my night as well, too. Thank you for calling in. My friend from Mova, I am missing you. Uh, you know. Uh, are, you, are you keeping luck? Thank you, thank you. All is well, and you? I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed with you. Yeah, I, I'm still around, I'm still around. God's blessings to you and the family. So yes. I miss Joycelyn still? Yes, yesterday, was, yesterday was, would have been her birthday. Oh dear, okay. Yes. Okay. okay, and we rem remember her. So in our thoughts and prayers, because yes. I know that she was also a fan of the show. Yes, that, that's Just right. as you are. That's right. Just as you are. Yeah, well. Yes, but be safe and enjoy the rest of the evening, sir. I, I will, I will, Doc, I will, Doc. Thank you for taking the time to call and share with us. You, you have a TSTST landline? Um, we do have a landline, and if you want to phone back after the show, so I'd be no, able to give you that no, number. Back, back in your office. Yes, yes, I'll be able to give you that number. Uh, Phone back after the show. All right, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening. Right, wow, what a lovely way to end this evening's program. And as usual, I like to, um, I like to end on an inspiring note. So and it's a reminder about human nature. So I have um, a video which I thought would be of relevance to all of us in the country. Let's have a look.
what a moving video but just a reminder about um, all the thoughts dreams emotions and fears that make us human and thank you to the cleveland clinic for that once more thank you to our splendid callers and viewers the brilliant ibn crew and supportive studio audience what a wonderful program it has been good night god bless and enjoy the week ahead <laughs>